Um, and really, we're sort of looking at this because a lot of these ideas. A lot of these ideas will come up again in the next few chapters, and then even at the end of the semester. So some of the sort of techniques that we're dealing with here, we'll use again in greater depth in later chapters. So like right now, today we're going to get into Gauss's Law and what have you, and we're just going to sort of give it a first review, but it'll come back a little bit later. So uh, if you feel like we haven't really covered it in depth enough, we'll get to it a little bit later. Um, let's see, last time we were talking about gravitation near the Earth's surface and how you know, we've always assumed that the gravitational acceleration is equal to our free fall acceleration. That is, the, the acceleration that I should feel because of my gravitational force is equal to the, the acceleration that, that I feel. And it turns out that those aren't ac actually the same, this gravitational acceleration, and then our actual free fall acceleration aren't the same for these reasons. One, that Earth's mass is not uniformly distributed. Uh, the Earth is on a sphere. So remember that shell theorem that, that Newton came up with? Do you remember what the shell theorem was? <coughs> yeah, if you have a... Uh, that's right, they're the same. So if you have a, a planet that's hollow in the middle and a planet that's solid throughout, they're going to be identical to an object outside of that planet. Right? A shell looks the same as a, as a solid sphere. Um, but it's only for spherical things, so the shell theorem doesn't apply to the Earth. We, we approximate it to be a sphere. It's basically a sphere, but it's not exactly a sphere. And then the big thing is that the Earth is rotating, so we have a centripetal force. And that, that's sort of the, the main reason that that gravitational acceleration is not equal to the free fall acceleration. And I started out here, this is sort of a lot of what we did last semester, uh, you know, rotational motion, Newton's laws, what have you, and we just uh, have a box that's going around at the equator, it's sitting on the equator, and so the Earth is rotating like this, there's the North Pole, and we can draw our force vectors, there's our normal force, there's our weight, and then we have a centripetal acceleration, and then the, the gravitational acceleration goes into our weight here. So now we want to figure out what is that gravitational acceleration. All right. So um, here, our normal force will equal to our mass times our g. And this is actually what we're going to want to find here minus m a g, which is uh, this value up here. And that's equal to m times a r. But if you remember, our a r is equal to negative omega squared r. Remember, that was our centripetal acceleration. If you recall, centripetal acceleration was v squared over r. But since v is equal to omega r, it's omega squared r. So that was from <coughs> last semester. Um, and then we can solve this for g, is what we want to know. Our g is going to equal to a g minus omega squared r. And we can find omega of the Earth, right? We have uh, 2 pi radians in 24 hours. So it turns out that the angular rotation of the Earth is about, it's an, about a ten thousandth of a radian per second, point zero zero. 0, 1 radians per second. All right, so we can plug that in for omega. We know the radius of the Earth uh, is about 6 million meters. And then we can find this g value, ag, that gm over r squared is 9.83, minus this additional term, our omega squared r is 0.034. And it gives us a value of 9.8 meters per second squared. All right, so you need to know that these gravitational accelerations and the acceleration, that the free fall acceleration and the gravitational acceleration are different values. Not by much, but because of this rotation of the Earth and the centripetal acceleration that these objects feel, these two values are different. So 
the, the 9.8 and the 9.83, which we get about from uh, Newton's universal law of gravitation. You'll see, we'll have some homework questions uh, when I send you out the homework that I deal with this. So it'll give you a little extra practice in this as well, sort of these ideas. All right, a couple more topics. We're going to look at gravitation inside the Earth, uh, Kepler's laws and Gauss's law, and gravitational energy. All right, so... Uh, No, I think we will skip gravitation inside here and just move it straight to energy. I think I can change my notes here. Alright, so let's look now at gravitational potential energy. This is going to come up uh, in chapter 2. So when we deal with potentials for electrical potentials, we'll see potential energy again, and we're going to deal with it in exactly the same way as we're dealing with it with potential energy for gravity. So that's why it's important, because we're going to see it again when we're dealing with electric potential, or volts or voltage, uh, which will come up in electric circuits as well. So gravitational potential energy. I'm going to call this U, variable U. Uh, we talked about this in reference to a particle in the Earth, but we can generalize it to just two particles. Say, uh, we're going to first set up a reference, a reference point, and our reference point will be when the two particles are an infinite distance apart. At that point, if these two particles are an infinite distance apart, what is the potential energy between the two? The gravitational potential energy between the two. If these two particles are an infinite distance apart, what is the gravitational energy between them? So for example, if you are an infinite distance away from the Earth, what is the, uh, the gravitational potential energy that you feel? It's what? No, at when R goes to infinity, what is our gravitational potential energy? It goes to zero because we have that potential energy G and M over R. All right, so if R goes to infinity, our gravitational potential energy goes to zero. Um, so then at this reference point, U is equal to zero joules. All right, for R less than infinity, then u is less than zero. And we've already said this, I think I've already said this. Let me go back and check my notes. No, maybe I haven't said this, I'm sorry. Uh, so we can find this u, and I'm gonna show you where it comes from. u is equal to negative g m m over r. So when r goes to infinity here, my potential energy goes to zero. And then when R is less than infinity, my potential energy is uh, less than zero. It's negative. <coughs> Guys, would it help for me to send you my notes for this? I know usually we have sort of the skeleton notes. Would you like for me to send out my notes for this? If I, I'll send them to you. I mean, you can still take notes. That's helpful, I think. But I'll send you. They're handwritten because uh, I've just sort of been going along. But I'll send you a PDF scan PDF of them, okay? Um, all right. So we can show that this is true, this expression, this GMM over R. Just going to do a quick proof of this. It's not a difficult proof. And this is what Newton did when he, uh, when he was working with his law of gravitation. Uh, we want to know what is the work done to move an object from a certain point to an infinite distance away. So let's say that this is the Earth. Uh, I have, say, I don't know, a baseball here, and I'm moving it from um, from a point P, so we'll call this the point P, 
out to an infinite distance away. So I'm moving the ball from P to infinity. And so if I want to calculate the work that's being done by the force there, my work is equal to the integral from um, R, where R is just the distance from the center of the planet to the point P to infinity. So I'm moving this object from a certain point R out to infinity, or from this point P, which is a distance R from the center of the planet out to infinity. And if I want to know the work, what do I do? Remember work, finding work. Okay, not just force times distance, but it was the uh, the dot product of those two. Remember f dot r. Remember, yeah, so in this case, f and r are in the same in the same direction, so it just comes out to be uh, force times distance. But it's f dotted the dot product of f and dr. All right, because it's an integral, we take a differential element of that that change in position, and we're going from uh, r to infinity. All right, turns out that f dot dr is equal to f r and f dr cosine of the angle phi or theta. Uh, that's just our definition of a dot product. Remember from last semester our dot product? Gary, you've had uh, seen dot products before? I've never used an integral in theory. Okay, well, if you want, we can, uh, this will come up again in the next chapter, but if you need help with it, please continue, we can work with it. All right. Um, now, in this case, our, our cosine of phi is actually 180 <laughs> degrees. So this works out to be because it's 180 degrees because our force, our gravitational force is in this direction, but our dr is in this direction. And the cosine of 180 is what? Negative 1. Right, so cosine of 0 is, is uh, 1, cosine of 180 is negative 1. So this turns out to be negative F dr. All right, so then our work, oh, then further we can say that F is equal to G M, M over R squared. And so our work then is equal to the uh, integral from R to infinity of uh, GMM over R squared dr. Uh, the negative of this dr. All I'm doing is I'm taking the integral of this term and I'm substituting Newton's universal law of gravitation in there. Alright, if I do this integral, it's a pretty simple integral. Uh, it turns out to be negative GMM over R. And that's equal to the work that's being done, which is also equal to our change in potential energy. So this is where our expression for potential energy comes from, that U is equal to negative GMM over your distance. All right, we'll have a very similar term when we're talking about electric charges. They'll have a gravitational, or excuse me, an electric potential that's very similar to this, except we're going to replace this with a different constant, and here we'll have charges, and then we'll have the distance between them. We'll see this again in chapter two, I think. Ch yeah, chapter two. All right, let me also introduce a new concept here for fields and equal potential surfaces. We sort of talked about gravitational fields. A gravitational field is just a measure of the uh, the gravitational acceleration, g. Per unit mass. So uh, I know f is equal to mg. So g is equal to force per unit mass. And these will help us to, to figure out what is the gravitational field. So the gravitational field will, will uh, map out this value g. If I look at the planet Earth, or any planet, or any any mass, I can ask myself what is the direction of the acceleration at a given point. So for example, at this point, the acceleration is down. 
Likewise, at this point, the acceleration is also down. And so I can draw a line through these vectors and say that all along that line, the vector g is going to be down towards zero. Right? right? You can do that all around. It's symmetrical. These are called field lines. And we'll see them and use them a lot more with charges later. Uh, these are field lines, and they show the direction of G along the field lines. So at any point along the field lines, the acceleration is going to be along that line. All right. We can also show uh, points where the vector G has equal magnitudes. So let's say that I have a, a point here where G has a particular magnitude. Where along one of these other lines does G have the same magnitude as it does here? At equidistant from the Earth. So uh, I also know that over here, at this point, I have the same G, because okay? it's the same distance from the center of the Earth. And so I can draw another line. <laughs> that looks like this. And all along that line, the, the vector g is going to be the same. We can also say that this is uh, a point where the potential energy is the same. So u here is constant. And so we call these equal potential surfaces. equal potential surfaces. And that just means that all along this line or this three-dimensional surface, like it, it extends out the three dimensions of the shell, the potential energy is all the same. Or also something we call the potential, which we'll get into in the next chapter. All right, so U is constant. Uh, we call that an equal potential surface. You can draw all sorts of equal potential surfaces. You can also have one here. And they will go out concentrically around the Earth. Anytime you're at, a, at, a, at an act or at the same distance from the center of the Earth, equal distance, then that'll be an equal potential surface. All right? Not terribly important right now, but when we get into chapter two, it'll become more important because we'll see the same thing. These lines, the red lines, by the way, are called field lines. You might also hear them called lines of force or field lines. And they just show the direction of the force or the acceleration of the particle. All right. Let's see. I think we're ready to do some clicker questions. Uh, did we get everybody registered last time? Right, I'm going to open up registration for just a moment. See, Christian, do you have yours? Oh, and Shay uh, and Harley. Christian, do you have your flicker? Yeah, why don't you go ahead and register? Just press DB. Are you on uh, AA frequency? Okay, you have to hold the power, I think, and then press AA. Early in today, we'll get you. I don't know why it does this. I don't know how to get our whip around it. There you go. All right. Give me just a moment, y'all. I want to go ahead and register them while I'm thinking about this. Uh... Do you have your, Shay, do you have your Flickr ID number?
And Harley, do you have yours? Yeah. Just bear with me, I'll try to get this done. Oh, you have an easy one. I might want to check that just to make sure. Alright. Alright, so a satellite orbits the Earth with constant speed and height above the Earth equal to the Earth's radius. The magnitude of the satellite's acceleration is what? So it's one full radius of the Earth above the Earth. or directly? Is it linearly or quadratically or, or, or related? I mean, you can talk to one another if you like. On these. See what you put. Seconds. I'll stop at one twenty five. Let's see, B. Now the acceleration is proportional to one over R squared, right? A is GM over R squared. So if I double that radius, it's gonna uh, it's gonna quarter the acceleration. And it does get smaller as you go up, not bigger. So A should be the right answer there. I don't know why the negative is there. It might have been a mistake. Because uh, it's just asking for the magnitude. I think that's just a typo. So the negative. Is that why y'all are thrown off? The negative? Okay, I'm sorry for that. This figure shows a binary star system. The mass of star 2 is twice the mass of star 1. Compared to F1 on 2. That is the force of particle... The force of particle 1 on particle 2, that is this force, the magnitude of the force 2 on 1 is what? So uh, this force is one quarter as big, half as big, twice as big, four times as big, are the same size as this. <coughs> How big is the force on this part? Stop at 115, 115. Okay, let's see, C, D is the right answer. It's the same size. Remember, our this is, goes back to Newton's universal law of gravitation. F is equal to G, M, M over R squared. So whatever force I feel on one part particle, I also feel on the other particle, identical, uh, because I, I, in both expressions I have both masses. This is also an expression of one of Newton's laws of motion. You know which one it is? You'll recall the first, second, and third law. 
that's the third law, right? So for every force, we have to have an action. For every one force, there has to be an equal and opposite force. It's equal in magnitude, but opposite in direction. And so I have a force that is equal in magnitude, but in the opposite direction as the other force. Okay, a planet has four times the mass of the Earth, but the acceleration due to gravity on the planet's surface is the same as on the Earth's surface. So the planet's radius is what? Remember your expression for the acceleration due to gravity for Newton's universal law of gravitation. That's that A equals GM over R squared. <laughs> I'll write that down for you. About 120, shoot for 120. <coughs> now, let's see, so my acceleration is the same, right? So A is the same, G doesn't change. The planet has four times the mass of the Earth. And so I want to know what is the, how does the radius change? See, most of you put D, D is right, because I have 2R squared. Uh, 2 squared cancels with the 4, so it gives us the same acceleration as we have on the Earth. So D is the right answer. All right, rank in order from largest to smallest. The absolute values of the gravitational potential energy on these pairs of masses. And the, uh, the numbers give the relative sizes of the masses. So if this one is two units, this one is half, and one unit, one unit, and this one is four units in mass. And then the distance is shown as well. And just to remind you, gravitational potential energy is GMM over R. GMM over R. We got that from doing that integral of the work, that integral of that by dr. Because you might want to just sort of write out the numbers, you know, disregard the constant, just write out the numbers for each one, and then over R. Looking pretty good, as you did have answer. Uh, we'll do about five or ten more seconds. I'll stop at 220. <coughs> All right, A, very, very good. A is the right answer. 
So uh, easiest way to do this, as I said, is just say mm over r for each of them. So this would be 2 times 2 over 4. That's this mass times this mass over this distance. Right? And that's not the actual potential energy because we don't have that, uh, gra that gravitational constant, but we're just trying to rank them anyway. So 2 times 2 over 4 is equal to 1. This is 1 times 1 over 1. So that's equal to 1. So I know that these two are identical. Uh, so I know then it's either 4 or 1, or D or A. Uh, and then I can go through and do these others. I have 1 times 1 over 2. So that's 1 half. 1 times 4 over 4, which is 1. So I know this one's identical to this one. So that gets rid of uh, this one. So this has to be the answer. And then it turns out this is 16 over 8, which is 2. All right? We're good on that? Okay, we'll come back to this. We're going to do Kepler's Laws next. Uh, I'll have this concept test up online on the concept test page on the website. All right. Um, let's look at now at escape speed as well. So you know what guys, we're just going to go straight into Gauss's Law, and then we'll see, we might come back and do escape speed. Really I want to hit these things that are going to be relevant for, uh, for electric fields and electric potential. So let's go ahead and do Gauss's Law, and then we might come back to do escape speed. All right, so uh, Gauss's law for gravity says that the, the flux inside a particular surface is equal to some constant. So first we just want to define what is flux, and then I'll, I'll express Gauss's law in an equation and show you what it means. So what is flux? Uh, in short, the flux is just the vec some vector times the surface area. In particular, we're looking at the gravitational field vector, the g vector. And so the flux is equal to, in short, just g, the vector g, that's our gravitational acceleration, times a surface area. This is going to come up again when we talk about electric fields. So uh, we'll, we'll see this again, and we'll probably deal with it more rigorously. But, in short, the flux is just some vector times the surface area. I'll draw you a picture in just a bit. We can describe this mathematically. We're going to use the Greek letter phi for flux. And phi is equal to the integral of our vector g dotted with a perpendicular unit vector. So this is just a vector that is normal to the surface area. is a unit vector. That is, we just want to know the, the vector g, the component that is normal for our surface area. This will become more apparent, I think, later. I'll draw some pictures to show you what it means. Uh, so this is just our mathematical definition. That's our flux, or excuse me, that's our, our g, and now we need to also include our surface area, and that's just going to be a differential element of our surface area. So this is... Uh, the differential element. Of our surface area. This is actually a special type of integral. It's an integral across a surface. You might sometimes see this as well in calc 3. I think I'll get the surface integrals. Is that right? Anybody in calc 3? Yo, don't do it in Calc 2, is that right? Anybody been through Calc 2? You've been through it? You do surface intervals? Like integrating over a surface? Or over a volume? We did it last semester. Yeah, you might see this also as like a double interval. Where you do like the integral of dx, the integral of dy, and you integrate over a surface. Did do that? No? Okay. Uh, engineering students, you'll probably see that as well when you go into engineering. Some of your higher level courses. We're not going to do that here. I'm just going to sort of mention it in passing. Um, 
but it just integrates over a particular surface. In order to integrate over a surface, you have to integrate across one variable, dx, for example, and then integrate across another variable, dy, in order to, to integrate across that surface. All right, now, so that's just our flux. Gauss's law, says that uh, this flux is equal to a constant value. It's equal, in fact, to negative 4 pi times g times the mass inside the surface. The mass inside. So this is Gauss's law. I'm going to show you several places where this comes into play and sort of what is the physical meaning of this. All right, I'm going to do three different scenarios. We'll do them fairly simply, so we're not going to actually do any integration, though we might do some of the integration later in the semester. We'll see. All right, can I go down from here? All right, uh, so just to rewrite Gauss's law, we just have our vector g times our area is equal to negative 4 pi g times the mass inside the surface area. So say, for example, I have a mass. It's a point mass. Uh, it can be a planet. It can be whatever you want to think of it as. I'm going to draw what we call a Gaussian surface. All right, this is a Gaussian surface. It is the surface through which I'm going to measure this flux. I'm going to measure all the flux that is coming through this surface. Remember we talked about we had these uh, these vectors, these field line vectors. I'm basically measuring how much of these field lines are actually coming through this surface, this Gaussian surface. And Gauss's law then says that uh, G times the area of this surface is equal to this negative 4 pi g times the mass inside. So g times the area of this Gaussian surface, which is a sphere, what is the area of a sphere? What is it, Gary? You're saying, I think. That's right, 4 pi r squared. So uh, g times that surface area of my Gaussian surface is going to equal to negative 4 pi g, big G, times the mass inside. And then if I solve for little g, which is really what I'm going to do, I'll get something that looks familiar to me. First of all, these 4 pi's are going to cancel out, and I'm left with negative gm over r squared. All right, which is the thing that we got before when we were talking about Newton's universal law of gravitation and Newton's second law. We combine those two. And then we get this expression for the acceleration due to gravity, gm over r squared. But this also falls out when we use Gauss's law, talking about fluxes <coughs> and these field lines. All right, so that's for a, a spherical surface. Uh, notice that it doesn't matter about the shape of the object inside the point. Like that's, that's irrelevant, the type of object inside there. It's only the, the shape of the surface that's relevant here. All right, we can do it for other surfaces. So let's say that we have a cylinder, a cylindrical shape like this. And I construct a cylindrical Gaussian surface around it. This is this imaginary surface. All right, so the red lines are my Gaussian surface. I can draw my field lines, my gravitational field lines. If we forget about the ends, the ends sort of do funky things where the field lines curve around. And so we'll just forget about the ends, saying that the cylinder is really long, and then the ends not really, they're not relevant. They, they, uh, they don't really contribute very much. I can do a similar thing here. I can say that uh, G times the area, that's my flux, is equal to negative 4 pi G times the mass inside, and then I can solve for g. So I get negative 4 pi g, the mass of the cylinder, the mass inside the surface, divided by the area of my cylinder. All right, And this is going to be 2 pi 
times r, that's the uh, circumference of the circle, times the length of the cylinder. All right, the four pi's cancel out, and I get negative g mass inside divided by rl. Oh yeah, so I get a, a two. I get a negative two. You're right. Thank you. All right. So what this means is, you know, like if we lived on a cylindrical planet, a long cylindrical planet, that our gravitational field would be a lot different. Instead of having the uh, the acceleration go down as one over r squared, it would have a one over r, a one over r uh, dependence instead of a one over r squared. So if you ever find yourself on a cylindrical planet, you can know that you're like this. Or on a huge cylindrical surface, right? Which isn't absurd, because sometimes, like in space, we get these big cylindrical structures. And you have to take into account that the gravitational fields on those objects is different from the gravitational fields that you would have with a spherical object. So this isn't just like some thought experiment, because in space, we do have these long filamentary structures. And so the gravitational fields and the way that gravity acts is different from the way that gravity acts on Earth. So I know that like, this seems mundane and not very important, but it's actually quite important that our, our gravitational acceleration is different for these different objects. We'll do one more. We'll do a, a flat sheet. Right, let's say that we have a flat sheet. looks like this. I'm going to construct a Gaussian surface on it, like a cube, sort of. Oh, I see. You're not supposed to see that. Not very good drawer. All right, so that's my, I have this big flat sheet of mass M right here, and then I construct a, a Gaussian surface. I'm going to measure that flux through it, and then by Gauss's law, I can say that uh, G times the area, the area of that Gaussian surface, since there are actually two surfaces, I'm going to call it 2A. I have to add those up. That's going to equal to negative 4 pi G times the mass inside. And then if I solve for g, I find that this is equal to uh, negative 2 pi g, the mass inside, divided by the area. All right, so what's interesting about this gravitational field that was not true about the other gravitational fields? There's a pi in there. Okay, yeah, the pi. That's true. There's a pi. But there's... Just divided by the area. Okay, what's missing from this? You're right. The radius. Right. So on this, it doesn't matter how far away you are from this this large flat structure, your gravitational field is always going to be the same. Right. And you can see that if you draw the field lines, because the field lines come out from this, like this, and they don't diverge. Whereas with the with the spherical object, the field lines came out like this, or they actually go out, go into it. But on these, the field lines diverge. And as we'll see in chapter 2, the, the density of the field lines actually represent the magnitude of the vector. So we'll, we'll get into that more. So this is actually pretty interesting. Like, if you come along a, a large flat structure in the universe, then the gravitational field is not dependent upon the distance from that structure. It's always going to be the same. Right? That's pretty cool, actually. Um, Let's see. I think that let's go ahead and do the escape speed. We have a few minutes left. And then we just won't do Kepler's laws. They're interesting and important, but not really important for electricity. So we'll just do the escape speed, which is pretty short and uh, it's really interesting. All right, so escape speed. This is the speed that you need in order to escape the gravitational field of, a, of an object. And we get it from uh, the projectile energy. So because of the projectile energy, or conservation of energy,
uh, one can find the speed required. Of a projectile. To leave an object's gravitational field. So basically, this is how fast you have to shoot a rocket up in order for it to leave the Earth. All right, so there's an actual speed that you have to attain in order to escape the gravitational field. Uh, so if I imagine the Earth, so I'm launching my rocket or my object from this point. Actually, uh, when they launch rockets, they launch it along the rotation axis of the Earth. So it's like the Earth, not only do the engines push off the rocket, but the Earth, the way that it's spinning, also gives the rocket additional speed, which is a considerable speed because the Earth rotates pretty fast. All right, so um, when the projectile reaches an infinite distance or an infinite height, both uh, the kinetic and potential energies are zero. So then I can say that U plus the kinetic energy is equal to zero. That's the gravitational potential energy. That's that negative GMM over R. Plus the kinetic energy, one half MV squared. That's all going to equal to zero. So I can solve for this. <coughs> and I get the velocity required, which is my escape velocity, it's just going to be the square root of 2gm over r. So that's going to be my escape velocity. That's just the velocity that's required for an object to leave the gravitational field of any object. Or it has to be a spherical object, or this would just be a spherical object. Okay, so that's sort of the end of the topics that we'll cover in chapter zero. I'll upload some homework questions for you. I know there's a lot there, and it'll, this will also be included on the equation sheet, the various equations that we've done. And I'll also send you just my handwritten notes for that sort of thing. I know there's a lot in this, and I know it's sort of jumping into a cold lake, right? Is this jumping into a cold lake? Are you okay? A lot of topics that we covered last semester. We're going to get into some new things next time. And actually, next time, a lot of what you, we've covered in my like third grade charge is basic principles. Like All right. So, brush up on your third grade science. And I'll see you all next Monday.